Okay, um, let me get started here and, and just note that as you'll see uh, with my affiliation here that I actually belong to two, actually more than two, but I'm highlighting two programs at UC Davis, the Department of Nutrition, which is my home department, <coughs> and also the program in International and Community Nutrition, which is a group of faculty members from a number of different departments whose primary research focus is on the nutritional problems of low-income populations, abroad as well as disadvantaged populations in the United States. And what I'm going to do this morning is to focus my remarks from this more global perspective to try to place in context what you'll be hearing through the rest of the weekend about the emergence of obesity and overweight as major public health problems uh, and also to say a, a bit about how we got to where we are. That's not working. <laughs> OK, so let me just uh, say a few words about what we mean when we talk about international nutrition. Um, and to describe that for you, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the characteristics of lower income countries, including uh, their demography or their population structures, disease patterns, and the nature of their food supply. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about a, the public health approach to nutritional problems, which is certainly different from what one does in the clinical uh, arena. And some of the specific uh, <clears throat> pieces of information which I will provide are um, studies on the global prevalence of different forms of malnutrition. I will focus primarily on undernutrition, which is my area of expertise. And we'll talk about different ways that we measure the prevalence of these different conditions of malnutrition, including the dietary energy supply of the country, the prevalence of childhood stunting or low height for age or wasting, low weight for height, the prevalence of certain selected micronutrient deficiencies, and then I will begin to touch on the problem of overweight and obesity, which is indeed beginning to appear as a public health problem in lower income countries as well. And finally, I'll just say a few words about our general public health intervention strategies for the control of undernutrition. And you'll hear much more through the course of the weekend about approaches to control overnutrition. Now, first of all, what do we mean when we talk about lower income countries? This is the uh, definition used by the World Bank to, def to classify countries in terms of the mean per capita income of individuals in the population. So a low income country is one that has a, a, a gross national income per capita of about $1,000 or less, which is to say that individuals in those populations are surviving on less than $3 per capita per day, certainly much less than what it cost you for your breakfast this morning or what it cost somebody for your breakfast this morning. Uh, and that would have to get them through the day as well as pay for their housing and clothing and any other incidentals. So we're talking about extreme poverty. Uh, we also focus on so-called lower middle income countries, which you see defined here. And by contrast, the higher income countries are those where there's a median per capita income of $12,000 and above. Now, I referred to some of these characteristics of lower income countries. And uh, I will describe a series of changes that occur as countries transition from lower to higher income. And these are changes which has, have been uh, noted over the course of a number of years in the way the population grows and the distribution of individuals in the population, the disease patterns within the population, the food supply and consumption patterns, and the types of nutritional problems that are associated with those environmental or ecological characteristics. Now, uh, earlier in the week when I checked again where we are in terms of global population, since the last time I gave a talk like this, we passed the threshold of 7 billion people with whom we share the Earth. Uh, you may remember back in the year 
2000 was when there was a lot of discussion about crossing the threshold of 6 billion, which was viewed as uh, earlier was viewed as the carrying capacity of the Earth. So we keep pushing that frontier in terms of how many people the global ecology can actually support. And that issue of population growth and implications for distribution of resources, environmental issues, and so on, continues to be a major concern. Now, this population growth is actually a relatively new phenomenon in the course of human history. You can see up to the year of about 1800, the global population was less than 1 billion. And most of the growth in global population has really occurred in the last 200 years or so, when we now have more than seven times the population that we had in 1800. And up to that time, you can see that the, the carrying capacity of the Earth for the total population was fairly stable over the course of recorded history. So this represents a major change that's occurred in fairly recent history in terms of this population growth phenomenon. Now the other interesting aspect of this, if you look at the countries that are responsible for this population growth, you can see that in the darker sort of teal shaded color below the economically more developed countries, that population growth kind of stabilized about the year 2000. And if anything is beginning to shrink uh, both in absolute and certainly in relative terms uh, as we move forward. By contrast, all of the population growth that we're describing is really occurring in lower income countries. So when we, when we look at these issues from a global perspective and think about numbers of people who are affected by different nutrition and health conditions, we're really talking about lower income countries. Now this is a little bit more complicated approach, but what I wanted to do here was to just to make the point that not only is population growing, but the way we live is changing dramatically. Let me just see if I can make this work. Now I know why I wasn't advancing the slide, because I was using the pointer. <laughs> OK, so this um, green line down below represents the population living in rural areas in economically more developed countries. And so what you see is that from 1950 projected out to 2050, the number of people living in rural areas in more affluent settings is going down. The number of people in these more affluent countries who live in urban areas is going up slightly, but as I showed you in the previous slide, the total population in these more developed countries is more or less stable, if not decreasing. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon happening in lower income countries. We see this tremendous growth that I described but we also see a similar pattern in that the number of people living in rural areas is going to peak in the next few years and start to decline. And what we see, which is the most dramatic, is this huge growth in urban populations in lower income countries. Now that, of course, has implications in terms of lifestyle, in terms of the type of food that people have access to, in terms of physical activity and the nature of the jobs that they perform. And this, of course, has implications for overweight and obesity, as you'll hear later in the course of the day. Now, uh, a number of the UN agencies have established goals for elimination of poverty, the so-called Millennium Development Goals. I won't go through those in detail, except to say that one of the goals is to reduce infant and young child mortality by two-thirds during this period from 1990 to 2015. And indeed, there has been tremendous progress in reduction of child mortality. Uh, in the year uh, 1990, I think we were somewhere between 13 and 15 million young child deaths per year. We're now below 8 million young child deaths per year. So we've almost halved the overall mortality rate during this period of time, which is a fantastic achievement, mm -hmm. but it doesn't begin to approach the Millennium Development Goals. As you'll see here, at the beginning of the period, to reduce child mortality by two-thirds in each of these different regions of the world, countries would have had to reach the yellow bar. 
And what you can see is this reduction that I've referred to, which in fact has proceeded in every region of the world, but not to the extent that has allowed us or will allow us to achieve the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. So we're sort of stuck in this period now where we are making advances in reducing child mortality, not to the extent we would like, but there's another phenomenon which has not yet changed, and that is the high fertility rate that we see in lower income populations. Fertility rate being defined as the number of uh, children that a, women, a woman bears over the course of her reproductive life. And we see this phenomenon in which in most parts of the world, this happened in the last century, that's the, the late part of the 19th century, uh, in Europe where child mortality started to come down and then usually followed by a generation or two, you begin to see fertility rate come down. And that change is what has been referred to as a demographic transition from a high mortality, high fertility uh, environment to one of low mortality and lower or low fertility. Now the interesting thing is that when you're caught in that middle zone, which is where we are in most of the developing world now, where we've been successful in reducing child mortality, not yet as successful in reducing fertility, we get a huge burgeoning of population. Because the, the population growth depends on this balance between birth rate and death rate. So what we're seeing now is that we have the beginning of the population transition or the demographic transition in lower income countries, but probably not till the latter part of this century will we begin to see population growth stabilize at a much higher level, somewhere around, well, it depends on whether you use the so-called optimistic or pessimistic scenario, but we'll be up well above 10, 12 billion people uh, on the uh, earth uh, as we reach stabilization. So what you see is that the percent of energy provided by vegetable fats is fairly constant regardless of the income level of the country. But as income goes up, there's much greater consumption of animal source foods and with that greater consumption of animal fats. And if you look over on the right hand side, a greater proportion of the protein intake is now coming from animal source foods rather than derived from plant products. The other major factor is that as income goes up, the use of heavily processed foods, including uh, specific sweeteners, goes up fairly dramatically. So not only do we see these demographic and health changes, but we see changes in the nature of the food supply with increasing economic development which may not necessarily translate into increased health in all cases. So just to summarize, let's talk about the demographic transition. In traditional societies, we see high fertility, high infant mortality and young child mortality rates, and that results in a young and mostly rural population. Not that it results in, but that's the description of what those countries look like. In more modern societies, we see low fertility, low infant mortality rates, and an aging and urbanized population. With the health transition, we see the change from major causes of death being infectious diseases to what we see in modern societies where the major causes of death now are so-called non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. We also look at nutritional conditions by anthropometric assessment of children's nutritional status. And typically, figures are produced uh, from representative samples of national populations on the prevalence of stunting, that is, the percent of children whose height for age falls below minus two standard deviations of the global standard, the new WHO 2006. Uh, growth standard. Uh, we also classify children in terms of underweight or low weight for age using the same cutoffs or wasted, that is low weight for height, again using the same cutoffs. What this map shows is the prevalence of stunting among children less than five years of age in different parts of the world. 
And again, you can see in South Asia and in much of Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 40% of the children are considered stunted, which is to say that their height for age falls below uh, minus two standard deviations of the global growth standard. These are data that just came out a couple of weeks ago in Lancet uh, by uh, a, a group uh, in London who's managing what's called the NIMS project. I can't remember what that stands for now, but I think it's something like nutritional indicators of mortality. At any rate, it's looking at all of the nutritional risk factors for mortality, updating the last Lancet series on child and maternal malnutrition. What the group have done is to take all of the data existing from different parts of the world looking at anthropometric status to develop trends to see is the condition improving or getting worse over time by region. And so each of those colors, which you probably can't see very well, represents a geographic region as defined by uh, the World Health Organization. The top panels show the mean height for age and weight for age in the right-hand panel for each of these regions. And what you can see is that in general, we have a pattern that's going up over time. That's good news. We're, we, the the, the z-score, mean z-score for height for age and weight for height is going up. But if you look at the axis here, this top axis here is minus 0.5. So even in the best of scenarios, the mean value in uh, these different regions of the world has still not approached a z-score of zero, which would be consistent with uh, the global standard. So things are improving, yes, but we still have a long way to go. What the other graphs show <coughs> is the prevalence then of stunting and wasting. So this bar shows the percent of children who are less than minus two standard deviations, either for height for age or weight for age. And again, the prevalences are going down in most regions. That's the good news, but they still remain very high from 20 to as much as 60% in South and Southeast Asia. And the other less than happy news is that this blue band here, which represents Sub-Saharan Africa, is not really improving over this course of time. So a lot more work needs to be done in that particular region. Now, why do we care? Is it that important to be a little taller or weigh a little bit more? Maybe not, but if you look at the relationship between uh, anthropometric indicators of nutritional status and risk of dying, what we see, this is now expressed as percent median, not z-score, but as children fall below 85% height for age as their z-score, the risk of mortality in all of these countries where that was studied begins to skyrocket. And this goes back to what I was saying before, that as children are more malnourished, their risk of infections, their risk of death increases fairly dramatically. So we're not just talking about trying to create a population with bigger children, but children who are more resistant to infection and death. Now, <clears throat> what are the causes of these child deaths? Um, first of all, let's just compare infant mortality rates in different uh, economic settings. You can see on the left the infant mortality rate of about 80 per thousand live births in the lower income countries compared with somewhere around five or six deaths of children during the first year of life per thousand live births in the more affluent countries. So more than a 20-fold difference in risk of dying in the first year of life if you have the misfortune of being born into poverty. Why are these children dying? Well, here you see some of the same uh, types of figures looking at um, now the under five mortality rate, so death rate of all children less than five years of age per thousand live births in the higher income countries and different regions of the world, including lower income regions like South and Southeast Asia, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So what you see is that in these poorer regions, much higher under five mortality rate, but then if you look at the, the causes of death, 
you see that in higher income countries, these are mostly uh, perinatal conditions and other, sort of a hodgepodge of genetic uh, accidents, uh, other fairly rare conditions. Whereas when you look at the, the causes of death in the poorer countries, we have diarrheal disease, acute lower respiratory tract infection, pneumonia in, oops, sorry, in sub-Saharan Africa, we see malaria as a major cause of death. And then again, this box of other. But more than half of the deaths of young children in lower income populations are, in fact, primarily caused, or the, the final cause of death is infection. <coughs> this is just to look at that issue again as what used to be referred to as the pie chart of causes of child mortality. Again, making the point that most of the deaths actually occur in the neonatal period, the first month of life. Many of those, in fact, are also due to neonatal infections like neonatal sepsis. But diarrhea, pneumonia, malaria account for other large pieces of the pie. So again, more than half the deaths due to infection. Now, the last time the WHO reviewed their mortality um, assignments, if you will, looking at the so-called global burden of disease, they recognized in the analysis that many of these deaths that are attributed to pneumonia or diarrhea or other infections are occurring at greater frequency in children who are undernourished, both because they're more susceptible to those infections and because once they get the infections, they're more likely to die from them. So in fact, what they've tried to project here in what we now refer to as the donut chart, no longer the pie chart, because the, the middle's been cut out to attribute those deaths to malnutrition. About a third of these deaths could be eliminated with more successful coverage of uh, nutrition intervention programs already known to be effective to reduce many of these causes of death. Now let me just change themes here from talking about uh, mortality and disease patterns to the nature of the food supply in different parts of the world. And I just wanted to make two points here. These uh, are data based on the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization's food balance sheets, which are uh, prepared each year to uh, assess the amount of food available in a given country for human consumption. And what this map portrays is the percent of the total energy supply in a country which is provided by the major staple food, whether that be rice or wheat or um, with rice mostly in Asia, wheat in northern China, northern India, the Middle East, uh, maize, cassava, most of sub-Saharan Africa, and then tubers in certain parts of the world, uh, yam, sweet potato, potato in, in other countries. And what you see here is that if you focus on these same countries that are responsible for the high mortality rate, that is countries in sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, some of the Latin American countries, the Andean countries and some of the Central American countries also uh, would fit into this, under this rubric of low or middle income. What you see is that a huge proportion of their dietary energy supply is coming from the major staple food. In some cases, more than 70% of what people are eating is a single staple. And then to look at that in a little bit more detail, here we see the uh, per capita income of countries along this y-axis. And the percent of total calories provided by different components of the food supply. We also see with increasing economic development this dietary transition from starchy staples, low fat diets with few animal source foods to diets that are higher in refined cereals and sugars, higher in fat, mostly coming from animal source foods. And finally, what I refer to here as the nutrition transition. That is a profile of nutrition problems that are associated with undernutrition and occasionally famine in lower income populations. 
and a rural population engaged in heavier, if not heavy, physical labor, contrasted with what we see in more modern societies, uh, overnutrition, more sedentary forms of labor, and less physical activity in recreational pursuits, and the emergence of overweight and obesity. Now let's move from this sort of uh, ecological perspective and just talk a little bit about the prevalence of different forms of malnutrition that we see worldwide. First I'll go back to these food balance sheets and call to your attention the fact that the Food and Agriculture Organization publishes yearly a report called Food Insecurity in the World, which is simply based on the amount of energy available in the national food supply. And they classify food insecurity as um, the percent of individuals in the population who are not able to cover their theoretical energy requirements given the existing food supply. And that's assuming an equitable distribution of the food supply, which of course is not the case in most parts of the world. And what you can see here is the percent of population in different countries um, who are not able to meet their energy needs through the existing national food supply. And again, you can see the same subset of countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South and Southeast Asia. Here we see some countries in Central America and Northern South America, which also would be classified as food insecure. So let's think for a moment, why are these children becoming mal malnourished? And I'm referring back here to a study done many years ago in Guatemala. That was a, a beautiful study looking at children's growth patterns in relation to a variety of environmental conditions. But in this particular slide, what I want to highlight is the fact that if you compare the Guatemalan children with the reference curve at that point in time, which is the solid line, First of all, the birth weight of the Guatemalan children was substantially less than what we see in North America. Second, you see this pattern, which I'll come back to later, and that is that the weight gain, in this case, tends to parallel what we see in North American children for the first few months of life, but then begins to flatten out. So for this long period of early childhood, which coincides with the period of what we call complementary feeding, I'll talk about in a moment, weight gain tends to flatten out. So we see a period of growth restriction. And the final point I wanted to make is that each of these lines reflects a, a track or a cohort of children according to their birth weight. And what you can see is that children with lower birth weight consistently are smaller throughout their childhood than uh, the children with higher birth weight. So much of their growth potential has already been determined at the time of birth, which is to say that the intrauterine experience of these children is already affecting what they will ultimately look like later in childhood. So why uh, do these children have low birth weight, you should be asking. And in fact, there are a number of reasons, but perhaps one of the most important is maternal nutritional status. This is a recent meta-analysis looking at the relationship between maternal body mass index and the risk of low birth weight, that is birth less than 2,500 grams, 2.5 kilograms, whatever that is, about five and a half pounds. And um, what you see here is that uh, children who are born to mothers with low body mass index are about twice as likely to be born with low birth weight. So now you begin to see this pattern where you have undernourished women giving birth to low birth weight children who grow less postpartum. What we refer to as this vicious cycle, if you will, of intergenerational malnutrition. So we need to expand our thinking in the prevention of malnutrition to focus on girls before they get pregnant, women during pregnancy, and children during the early months and years of life. <coughs> 
Uh, this is just to emphasize the point of the relationship between maternal nutritional status and birth weight, looking at factors that explain intrauterine growth restriction. And you can see that maternal short status, maternal low pre-pregnancy weight, and maternal low caloric intake during pregnancy, or low weight gain during pregnancy, explain about half of the risk of low birth weight, or IUGR. And it's not just maternal weight or energy status that's important. It's also maternal micronutrient status. And I won't get into this in great detail, just to give one example. And this is actually from a US population who were supplemented with iron or placebo during pregnancy. Uh, this was a study done by the Centers for Disease Control that showed that the uh, percent of children in the US born with low birth weight decreased from 17% in the placebo group to 4% in the group whose mothers were supplemented with iron during pregnancy. So there are a variety of specific micronutrients during pregnancy that also are influential in birth weight and, as we may hear from Christine, in postpartum growth of children as well. OK, now let's look at growth postpartum. We talked about the importance of birth weight as a predictor of children's ultimate growth. But we also see this is a, a uh, a graph of mean z-score for um, different regions of the world. And this is height for age z-score. So if these children were growing the same as North American children, you'd see straight lines at zero. That's what's expected. The fact that these z-scores are falling almost from shortly after birth to about two years of age means that there's something going on in this postnatal environment as well that's causing growth failure postpartum. There are a number of reasons for that. Obviously, the quality and the amount of the diet are important. But this is also a period when children have high risks of infection. And we know that infection contributes to malnutrition. And as I said before, malnutrition uh, affects the risk of infection. So again, we have this other vicious cycle of malnutrition and infection, uh, which place these children at greater risk of poor growth postpartum. Now, much of the key to this is breastfeeding. Uh, we know that breast milk is nutritionally adequate for children for the first few months of life. We assume at least six months of life with regard to most nutrients. And we also know that exclusive breastfeeding is protective against infections because children are less exposed to other contaminants in the environment, particularly foodborne contaminants uh, that cause disease. And this is just to reemphasize that point to show that with regard to diarrhea-associated deaths, if you compare children who were exclusively breastfed, this reference category in green, and children who are not breastfed, there's a tenfold risk of dying among children who are not breastfed. This is in the first six months of life. And a 15-fold increased risk, which is not always appreciated, for dying of pneumonia among non-breastfed children. We also can see the same thing with morbidity, or these diarrhea and pneumonia incidence figures, which are major explanatory variables in terms of that poor postnatal growth pattern. So again, with adequate breastfeeding practices, early initiation and the first hour of life, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life, we would reduce this disease experience and the disease-associated secondary malnutrition. Now let me just quickly review some of the major micronutrient deficiencies of public health importance in lower income countries. We um, define these as being important in public health terms, one, because of a relatively high prevalence of the condition, and two, the fact that that condition then predisposes to some adverse health outcomes. So when we talk about vitamin A deficiency, we know that vitamin A deficiency is a major cause of childhood blindness worldwide. Uh, and uh, 
has also been shown to be associated with an increased risk of severe infection and mortality. A uh, number of mineral deficiencies are critically important. Uh, I can't show you a picture of zinc deficiency because there aren't obvious clinical symptoms of uh, the prevailing mild zinc deficiency. But we also see a high prevalence of iron deficiency as evidenced by this so-called palmer, pallor, the very light color of the palm, which is the way you can diagnose clinically the presence of moderate or severe anemia. Iodine deficiency not only resulting in goiter, but in some settings resulting in cretinism. So growth retardation and uh, mental deficiencies, <laughs> developmental deficiencies related to severe iodine deficiency. And we're sure that there are other micronutrients of critical importance. There just isn't sufficient data yet from poorer populations to know the prevalence and severity of these conditions. I'm going to have to go through this very quickly because I'm soon to run out of time. But I just want to let you know that the World Health Organization does track the prevalence of these major uh, micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, this is the latest update on the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. So countries that show a darker green color are ones with a higher prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. Many of these same countries in the tropical belts of Asia and Africa and South America, Central South America, again, show up as high, having a higher risk of vitamin A deficiency. Again, why do we care? Well, there are a number of trials um, that have been done providing vitamin A supplementation to children in these high-risk countries. And the overall result of these trials is that there's a 23% reduction in child mortality, a huge reduction, uh, simply with the delivery of vitamin A capsules. And this is a, a real success story in terms of public health programs globally. By delivering high-dose vitamin A capsules twice yearly, uh, we believe we've had an important impact in contributing to this lower uh, 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 infant and child mortality rate that I described to you previously. I'm going to skip this for the moment. And I'm going to skip this and this. So let me just finish by saying a few words about some of the approaches we have to uh, address these problems. First and most important, as nutritionists, we are always focusing on the diet as the provision, the, the major way of providing nutrients. And so to improve the quality of the diet, we need to modify in a variety of different ways what people are eating or how they're eating it, so-called dietary diversification and modification approaches. These are difficult because they require changes in the access to food. And they also require behavior changes on what foods are, are selected and how they're consumed. So among the list of possible interventions, of course, is the focus on breastfeeding that I've already described to you, appropriate complementary feeding. We're not going to have time to talk about that. But essentially, this is the first foods that a child gets in addition to breast milk beginning at about six months of age. Greater use of animal source foods as particular foods that are rich in bioavailable nutrients, and particularly some of these limiting nutrients that I described, vitamin A, iron, zinc, uh, uh, for which animal source foods may be the only way you can make the traditional diet sufficient using a food-based approach. And finally, agricultural interventions, both to increase, increase the, the total food supply, remember we talked about food insecurity being an issue in many countries, but also to improve the nutritional quality of the food supply. And we're now working on a series of interventions called biofortification, where we selectively breed for varieties of these major staple foods that are rich in particular nutrients so that we can enhance the nutrient intake. And then finally, uh, simple uh, approaches to food processing to improve the food quality, both from a microbiological perspective as well as a nutrient bioavailability perspective.
There are another of other intervention strategies to specifically to control micronutrient deficiencies, including supplementation, providing specific nutrients in more of a medicinal form, food fortification, adding nutrients to the st food supply. This is only possible, of course, if the food system is sufficiently developed to be able to do this. And then finally, what I refer to as public health interventions, that is reducing the incidence of infections that contribute to malnutrition. For example, by increasing hygiene and sanitation to reduce diarrheal disease, to provide intermittent preventive treatment for malaria or insecticide-treated bed nets uh, to reduce malaria incidence, by periodic deworming to reduce the nutritional uh, complications of intestinal helminth infection. Then the final thing that we must continue to do is to screen for malnutrition so that those children who fall through the cracks of these preventive interventions are identified with weight, height, or often what we do in communities is simply arm circumference, to identify those at risk of acute malnutrition and provide more intensive counseling or food supplementation as required. Now I wanted to finish with just a couple of comments to introduce the next set of speakers who will be talking about overnutrition, overweight and obesity, to say that the World Health Organization in 2005 began for the first time to track the prevalence of overweight and obesity in lower income countries as well. And this is what the global map looked like in 2005. The red countries are those that have a very high prevalence of uh, uh, high BMI, greater than 25, among women greater than 30 years of age. So you can see North America and a couple countries in Africa and the Middle East, very high prevalence of overweight and obesity. 2015 projections show that more countries in South America are going to join this unhappy story, as well as a few more countries in the Pacific region and the Middle East. There seems to be a direct trade-off in the prevalence of underweight. This is the prevalence of um, um, underweight in selected countries. And in the right-hand panel for the same countries, the prevalence of overweight. We just don't seem to be able to get it right. In the process of this transition of moving from lower prevalence of underweight, we almost automatically seem to slip into this uh, uh, picture of high prevalence of overweight. And that's the real challenge. How do we get that right? This is not just a problem of women or adults, but we're also beginning to see the emergence of higher or increasing prevalence of overweight among uh, preschool children. These are global estimates and projected out to 2020. Still low compared to what we see in the US, for example, but increasing in an alarming way. And we can see that this increasing prevalence of overweight and obesity is occurring in all regions of the developing world. So to finish, let me just remind you again that most of the world's population live in lower income countries where the major nutritional problems are still related to undernutrition, low birth weight, poor infant young child feeding practices, stunting, wasting, and micronutrient deficiencies. And the greatest risk of these problems occurring among women and young children. So most of our focus in public health programs now is on the so-called first thousand days from the period of conception through the first two years of postnatal life when the greatest bulk of this malnutrition is occurring. We need these effective public health, well, not that we need them, but we already have effective public health uh, interventions that are known to work and can ameliorate these problems, but they're simply not yet being implemented at sufficient scale to address the problem. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned in my concluding remarks, with increased income and a changing food supply and lifestyles, overweight and obesity are beginning to emerge as public health problems even in these lower income countries. So what you're going to hear about through the rest of the weekend focusing mainly on this public health problem that you're facing here in California is actually a global problem that we're just beginning to understand and to deal with. So I will finish there.
say goodbye to all of you, and thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you.